to the very first edition of Dale's Study Session podcast. And um, for the very first locus of our study um, in this podcast, I just wanted to share some of my research on the truth of Christianity based on the evidence from the Shroud of Turin. Uh, This is a topic that I myself personally find fascinating, and it's one of the reasons that I uh, converted to Christianity. It's one of the reasons I think Christianity is true, and therefore I think it's really important for both Christians and non-Christians to become familiar with uh, the type of evidence that the Shroud provides so they can make their own decisions. Now, just by way of a heads up, uh, this is going to be a multi-part series uh, on the Shroud itself. So uh, what I'm going to be doing is taking you through the various aspects of the Shroud and the evidence from the Shroud of Turin in terms of how they relate to my criteria for being what I call a G-Belief authenticating event, or in layman's terms, a, a miracle or, or a sign from God uh, for the truth of the Christian religion. And just by way of an introduction, um, you know, we want to find out, okay, well, what is this Shroud of Turin of which I'm talking about? And basically what it is, it's a, it's a linen burial cloth measuring about 14 feet long uh, by three and a half feet wide. And it is a uh, burial shroud, which is a, a long garment or a long uh, cloth that is used to bury people. Um, basically, when a person dies, a, a person is buried in a shroud uh, so that they're laid lengthwise uh, on the lower part of the cloth while the rest of the cloth is then folded over the person to cover them uh, and wrap the individual uh, in preparation for the afterlife. And this is a a funeral practice that's been around from ancient times well before the time of Jesus up until the modern day. It's still practiced throughout the Middle East uh, by many Muslims, for example. And in terms of the Shroud of Turin, it gets its uh, present name from Tur- the city of Turin, Italy, which was the uh, former capital city of the House of Savoy. And the Shroud of Turin has actually resided there since the year 1578. Uh, so as of 2018, that's going on about 440 years now. And what's fascinating about the Shroud is it, it contains the full-length frontal and dorsal side images of what appears to be a naked and battered man. And, um, you know, no surprise, Christians uh, have purported that uh, this shroud man, so to speak, is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And, you know, they point to uh, passages in Scripture, such as uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 4 to 10. And I'll just take a a moment to read that to you. And in context, this is talking about um, when the apostles Peter and John Uh, found out that the tomb was empty. Uh, They both ran together to the tomb to check this out. And here's what the Bible says. So they ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came first to the sepulcher, or tomb. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the tomb, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin, or head cloth, uh, that was about his head, was not lying with the linen cloths, or clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So, typically pro-shroud enthusiasts, or Christians, are saying this is what the shroud is. This is the burial cloth that's mentioned in the Gospel of John. And what's fascinating is that the the formation of these uh, Shroud Man images that are purported to be Jesus are actually currently an enigma to modern science. Uh, Back in in 1978, a a group of world-renowned scientists and experts assembled to form what was called the STIRP Group. So that stands for the Shroud of Turin Research Project. And this was organized in an effort to ascertain how the images were formed and, you know, answer many questions about the Shroud through 120 hours of intensive hands-on or in-person analysis of this uh, Shroud. And, you know, during which they used the very latest technology and and scientific know-how at that time in order to address this question along with 
uh, many others that that were uh, raised at that time uh, about the shroud and how the images were formed. So. They, in addition to the uh, 120 hours of intensive study, they also removed hundreds of samples, and they used these samples for later examination in their laboratories afterwards. Um, the findings of, of which were published in many peer-reviewed academic scientific journals, and um, you know this has really been the only study. Uh, that to date that's been done or conducted on this level of scientific rigor uh, in terms of any religious relic really but uh, in terms of the shroud at least this this is the only intensive study that's been conducted to date now unfortunately rather than conclusively providing any final answers as to how the shroud images forms formed the results of their investigation actually served only to further deepen the mystery and intrigue surrounding these images. And, and quite obviously, this fueled a lot of public fervor and, and interest in the Shroud and, and wanting to learn more about it. Because, uh, you know, in, in 1981, when Sturp issued their final report, um, they basically stated they, we don't know how the images uh, could have been formed. As uh, Sturp put it in their uh, final findings, they conclude, uh, you know, thus the answer to the question of how the image was produced or what mechanisms produced the image remains now, as it has in the past, a mystery. And this also, uh, I'm going to have to paraphrase here because I don't have it memorized, but I, I think it was uh, Sturp scientist John Heller who, who famously made a quote saying, you know, if you give me a budget of $20 million uh, and all the latest scientific equipment and know-how, I could still, I would still not know how to reproduce similar shroud images. So, uh, you know, the result uh, of this scientific investigation, we, we were able to eliminate some explanations and we were able to advance our understanding greatly of the shroud images. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we, we still, Sturp was unable to answer how the shroud images were formed. So, in terms of the the Shroud's provenance. As I was saying, prior to uh, 1578, the Shroud can really only be reliably traced back, with, without any degree of doubt, back to the year 1355 AD. Um, and this is when it was uh, first publicly displayed in Europe for the first time in the small provincial town of Liri, France. Uh, at that time, the cloth was in the possession of a famous French knight named Geoffrey de Charnay. And, you know, this this obviously leads many skeptics to believe, well, that, that just shows the shroud is nothing more than a medieval Catholic hoax. It's the same as all the other so-called Christian relics that were circulating in the medieval period at that time, you know, like the Spear of Longinus or the... Uh, splinters from the cross of Christ, uh, you know, the, the Shroud has no relation to the historical Jesus. And unfortunately, this um, supposition of the skeptics seems to have been confirmed. In, in 1988, there was an infamous carbon-14 dating that took place, and which, as I said, seemingly confirmed this, this skeptical notion that the, the Shroud is nothing but a medieval hoax. It dates to the medieval period, and um, therefore it's just another fraud. So, you know, ever, ever since then, the Shroud's historical provenance or origin of the Shroud images has, has continued to serve as a, a stumbling block, block to serious consideration, both in academia and in the general public's mind, uh, as to, you know, how the Shroud can count, count as evidence for the truth of Christianity. So, since this is dating issue is the obvious elephant in the room, uh, I think it's fair that we should start and, and address this dating issue straight out of the gate. Uh, because, you know, most people, including pro-Shroud proponents, seem to have this obsession with the issue of the dating of the Shroud. And, you know, when exactly the shroud images originated? Did it truly belong to the historical Jesus, or is it just another medieval relic? And you know, people seem to think that this issue is 
paramount in terms of determining whether the shroud has any anything to say on the truth of Christianity. And what I would want to do is, in the first place, I want to suggest that the issue of whether the shroud images were formed during the time of Jesus Christ or later on during the medieval era is actually totally irrelevant, or at the very least, it's not a necessary factor in concluding that the shroud's images are a G-belief authenticating event or a, a sign from God for the truth of Christianity. Now, while it's all well and good, great, I, I would love it if the Shroud of Turin could be linked to the historical Jesus and, and the Shroud images were formed as, as a result of the miraculous resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, so much the better. Yes, that, that helps. But I don't think it's necessary. And, and let's just assume for the sake of argument for a second that the shroud images could be proven with 100% certainty to be formed using mechanisms that would be deemed miraculous. Why isn't it just as likely that God could have created such miraculous images on the shroud at any other time in human history? Um, you know, certainly Christians do recognize that God is perfectly at liberty to perform miracles at any time in human history if he so chooses. Uh, the example of, of modern interest in Christian miracle healings or answers to prayers uh, seems to establish my point here in, in the fact that miracles attesting to the truth to the truth of Christianity or the or of Jesus do not necessarily have to occur at the same chronological point as when Jesus lived in order to be considered valid or related to Christianity. So, you know, with, likewise with the shroud it, dating to the medieval period, why couldn't it be the case that God used a miraculous event for whatever reason during the medieval period as well? Uh, just as a sheer speculation, maybe Jeffrey de Charny, the, the shroud's first recorded owner in Europe, maybe he was praying one night for a sign from God, and for one reason or another, God answered that prayer with the miraculous shroud images. Um, this is at least a, a possibility to consider. Now, at this point, I can see various skeptics coming up with some objections to this. You know, a medieval miracle, you know, Jeff, Jeffrey DeCharny uh, was praying one night and God, poof, zapped a, a miraculous shroud image. Come on, th this is implausible. This is totally ad hoc. Uh, you know, why would God do such a thing? I mean, he, when's the last time God answered your prayers with such a direct, miraculous uh, response, right? Well, in the first place, it, it's not implausible. There's nothing implausible about this suggestion. He, you know, God is an omniscient being. He is perfectly at liberty to perform miracles at any period in human history in order to accomplish his goals. Um, through his divine providence. And, and Molinistically speaking, I'm a proponent of what's called Molinism. So God has middle knowledge and, you know, he, even with simple foreknowledge, God, there may be any number of reasons as to why God might have performed this particular miracle at this particular time. Uh, you know, the, some of the goals of which may not have been, may not even have uh, materialized yet. They may not occur for another 100 or 200 years into the future from now. And as for the this suggestion being ad hoc, well, yes, uh, of course, it's not being proposed as a positive historical claim about what actually happened, but I'm just merely appealing to this as an equal possibility, you know, which could account for the miraculous nature of the Shroud's image formation, but yet at the same time allow for a medieval date of origin, as opposed to having to date the Shroud back to the uh, historical Jesus himself. One final uh, objection that I can picture the skeptic, and I've heard a few skeptics raise this to me, is the issue of sufficient attachment. You know, so, some skeptics think that establishing the Shroud of Turin's connect, connection uh, as the actual burial cloth of the historical Jesus is absolutely essential to demonstrating that the Shroud has any sort of religious significance in a, within a Christian context. And I just want to respond that this is absurd. I mean, so long as, I would say, so long as a reasonable connection can be established between the Jesus of Christianity and the Shroud images, then a chronological connection is not necessary. 
For example, to illustrate my point, let's say we had a modern Christian painting uh, of Jesus. Um, everyone knew this was meant to be Jesus. It's the traditional Jesus uh, picture. He, he's a white guy, blonde hair, blue eyes. And he's knocking on the door. Um, you know, and, and we know with absolute certainty that this particular painting is just an ordinary painting produced in the year 1985, uh, centuries after Jesus lived. But let's say after praying one night uh, to God for a sign, God then zapped that, pic that picture, transforming it into a miraculous image of Jesus. And, you know, scientists study it and they conclude, yes, this is a supernatural miracle. That's, or this is a miraculous image. We can't explain it, blah, blah, blah. Um, then I would suggest that this is enough to show that this image is clear. The fact of the, that the picture was clearly meant to portray Jesus Christ you know, we get this from the contextual indicators. We recognize pictures that are meant to depict Jesus. And this, this, these contextual indicators alone are enough to warrant a reasonable connection or a sufficient attachment uh, to Jesus, to the Jesus of Christianity specifically. Now, as one final point, I, I mentioned that this picture doesn't look like Jesus. It's a you know, the white, the traditional white Jesus, blonde hair, blue eyes, uh, you know, and this doesn't correspond to what the historical Jesus actually looked like. Very probably he was Jewish. He probably didn't uh, have blonde hair, blue eyes. He was, you know, he was of Palestinian uh, descent. So he probably didn't look the way that the picture depicts him. Does this invalidate that the uh, mirac the miraculous image is sufficiently attached to attesting them through the Christianity again? No, because there's a necessary connection. There is a reasonable connection. We know from the contextual indicators that this picture is meant to portray Jesus Christ. And therefore, that is enough to say that it's attesting to the truth of the Christian religion. We can clearly, we clearly know that this is a picture uh, of Jesus, of the Christian faith. So I think that, uh, without further ado, I, I think that takes care of the issue of whether the dating of the Shroud is even relevant or not. And I think I've successfully argued it's not. I, I mean, it's, it's obvious that it's not. So long as a reasonable connection can be established, a chronological connection is not necessary to, es to establish the truth of Christianity. However, that said, just out of curiosity, we, we shall now turn to looking at some of the evidence with regard to the Shroud's historical providence and, you know, try to discover what, what conclusions can be drawn in that regard. Can uh, we determine whether the Shroud is medieval versus dating to the historical Jesus? And uh, on that front, we're going to actually start with the biggest thorn in the pro-Shroud proponent's side. And as I've told you before, that's the infamous 1988 carbon-14 dating. Well, as was mentioned before, the 1988 carbon-14 dating results put the Shroud at somewhere between 1260 and 1390 AD, plus or minus 65 years, with a claimed 95% degree of certainty. And this announcement was given at a press conference in one of the basements of the British Museum on October 13th, 1988. And it literally sent shockwaves throughout the world at that time. Um, you know, as, as I said, it was at this moment that the public, by and large, turned its back on the Shroud evidence, uh, mindlessly believing whatever the media told them to believe, uh, you know, as, as was evident in many of the day's uh, newspaper headlines, such as uh, one example from the London Times, uh, confidently reading out, Turin Shroud, shown to be a fake. Um, you know, seemingly case was closed at this point. Case closed. The shroud is medieval. Uh, period. Uh, right? Uh, no. Wrong. Fortunately for us, the Sturp scientists and experts who actually studied the shroud back in 1978 and knew more than anyone on the planet about the true nature of the shroud's evidence had no intention of allowing such misinformation or biased conclusions to stand unopposed. Now, carbon-14 dating is uh, a radiometric dating technique that allows us to date organic objects from the date of their death uh, 
um, via the radioactive decay of carbon-14 isotopes, which remain in a given sample. And the way radiocarbon dating works, so um, basically it essentially is a method designed to measure the residual amount of the radioactive carbon isotope known as carbon-14 that remains within a, a given sample that they're testing. Now, carbon-14 is an unstable or radioactive isotope that's naturally occurring uh, within the, the atmosphere, in the biosphere, and, and plants incorporate this through the process of photosynthesis. And then, obviously, via the food chain, animals eat the plants, they get these, car these carbon-14 isotopes in them, uh, animals, that eat, animals that eat the plants, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, this includes uh, plants such as the flax plant, which just happens to be what the shroud was made out of. So when, when an organism dies, it stops intaking these carbon-14 isotopes in it so that it's no longer going to be on par with the atmosphere or the biosphere. Um, and through the law of radioactive decay, or the radioactive half-life as it's called, Approximately every 5,730 years, half of the uh, carbon-14 elements, which are unstable, will have converted to nitrogen-14, which is a stable isotope. So therefore, by measuring how much is in there, you can estimate the age with uh, relative certainty. Now. A problem with carbon-14 dating, uh, as with all radiometric dating techniques, is that there are certain, there are at least three different assumptions that need to be at play in order for it to work. And questioning one of these assumptions will throw it off. Um, now, the first one is that the original amounts of the radioactive isotope, in this case carbon-14, can be known. Uh, you know, uh, radiocarbon scientists usually assume, assume it was at the level of the atmosphere. Um, however, there's also the radioactive, the assumption that the radioactive half-life has remained constant. You know, every 5,730 years, half of those carbon-14 elements will convert into nitrogen. Uh, if that rate of decay hasn't remained constant, that will throw off the carbon-14 results. Um, now, the first two assumptions are not really controversial uh, in science. Nobody really questions that, at least not within shroud research. There are young earth creationists who take issue with that, so that it is a valid uh, question to study if you want to take issue with those assumptions. But it's really the third assumption that concerns us, and that's the issue of contamination. Uh, radiocarbon scientists have to assume that there's no contamination and or that the contamination could factor could be eliminated through uh, you know their cleaning protocols or something like that. But contamination really refers to the fact that carbon-14 molecules or isotopes can be added or taken away artificially uh, outside of the natural radioactive decay process. And really, uh, pro-shroud advocates or, or STIRP scientists have typically questioned this third assumption, saying that in some way the shroud sample that was uh, dated in 1988 was contaminated in some way, thereby artificially inserting carbon-14 isotopes uh, into the shroud sample, making it appear younger than it actually is. And there have been um, several examples known to science uh, that you know, this does occur and throws people off. That there have been examples of living snail shells that have been dated, uh, carbon dated to 26,000 years old, uh, or a newly killed seal uh, dated to be 1,300 years old, or uh, similar to the shroud, uh, wrappings of an Egyptian mummy uh, were dated, carbon-14 dated to be 1,000 years younger than the body was known, historically known to have been wrapped. So. Uh, the issue of contamination is a real one. It's one that scientists readily acknowledge and that they try their best to tackle to the best of their ability, but nonetheless, it, it, it's always a factor that might not be totally, uh, scientists might not be able to totally eliminate as a possible factor to throwing off uh, carbon-14 dating results. Now, at this point, uh, before I get into the uh, issue of contamination or addressing radiocarbon date, 
uh, dating uh, itself, it, it's important uh, to mention the issue of bias and personal bias on the part of radiocarbon scientists. Um, and it, it's not something I typically like to get into, but it, it's important to mention this because the, the 1988 radiocarbon scientists were horribly biased, or at least the lead scientists uh, in charge of the expedition were. And the lead scientist here was uh, Harry Gov. And just so you don't think I'm engaging in some sort of ad hominem attack, um, this is well documented. Harry Gov himself wrote his own book in 1996, and his own book admits, yes, I was totally biased against the involvement of STIRP. Um, here's just a quote of, of what he said. So, I believed STIRP's members to be so convinced it was Christ's shroud that I was determined to prevent their involvement in its carbon dating. Uh, and this is even though it was their idea to do the carbon dating. It was STIRP that invited Harry Gov and the car radiocarbon laboratories to get involved and date the shroud. So, so Gov continues, I, I feared the most important measurement that could be made on the shroud would be rendered less credible by their participation. Fortunately, I was successful in removing their involvement entirely from the shrouds, um, from the shroud, uh, the second study of the shroud, including the radiocarbon dating. Gov also went on to remove, a, Sturp had originally about 26 different scientific tests uh, involved, and they contacted seven radiocarbon laboratories to be involved in dating the shroud. Gov made it his business to eliminate all those tests so it was just the radiocarbon dating that took place and also uh, eliminated uh, all but three of the radiocarbon lab laboratories involved in radiocarbons uh, date in the radiocarbon dating now this is the opposite of what science is about we the more data the better we shouldn't be restricting data so i, I have no respect for for gov and his biased uh, biases and his his censoring of you know scientific progress. Um, so I, I want to say that he this is well documented. You can buy his own book and read it for yourself if you think I'm just engaging in ad hominem attacks. But um, I think his tactics were despicable, quite frankly. Not only that, but it, also the procedures uh, themselves were were off. I, I mean, Sturp originally wanted there to be multiple samples taken from different locations on the shroud. And this was to help prevent or eliminate, help to mitigate against uh, contamination uh, of some kind. Dove uh, got that chain. No, just one sample. That's all we need. Um, again, this is, this is not the way science is done. Not only that, did they just choose one sample, they also chose the worst possible location, scientifically documented that this was the one of the worst locations to take that sample from. And where they got the sample um, was actually in a, a place where we uh, got a, a previous sample back in 1973. Um, Professor Rays removed part of the shroud uh, for for study and and uh, and dating purposes, and it was determined by Rays that this sample was heavily contaminated because there was certain things on the fibers that he couldn't get off with pretreatment solutions. There uh, was cotton found in the in these fibers as well, which was non-representative to the shroud as a whole. And what was funny is in, in 1986, this was this was known about, and uh, at a at a conference that resulted in the Turin Protocol, which was a set of protocols agreed to by the radiocarbon scientists and was not fulfilled by Gov and his ilk, um, stated that in order the in order to address the non-uniform contamination problem. Um, you know, we need to take samples from different locations of the shroud. And Meacham cautioned that, you know, no responsible radiocarbon scientist would claim that it was proven that all contaminants had been removed and that the dating range produced for a single sample was without doubt its actual calendar age. Thus, 
these scientists should have known better. You, you should have used multiple sta uh, samples for statistical purposes, but yet they didn't. Uh, this is just pathetic, and it's not the way science is done. And finally, just as a last point, uh, in, in terms of Gov's comments on STIRP, you know, oh, they're just a bunch of fundamentalist Christians. You hear, you hear skeptics make this ad hominem false attack on the STIRP scientists who were the world's experts in some of their fields at that time. Um, the, these STIRPs, STIRP scientists were not all Christians. Some of them were, sure, but a lot of them were Jewish. A lot of them were atheists or agnostics who, who weren't Christians that were involved solely be based on the merits of their expertise. Um, you know, just think about it for a second. Um, it was STIRP members that invited Harry Gov and the radiocarbon laboratories to be involved in the process. Why? Because they, they felt they had reputations as being leading scientists in that particular field, therefore wanted their expertise. So one should be cautious before dismissing um, the STIRP scientists as just a bunch of fundamentalist Christians. That's an unfair attack on what these men um, you know, achieved and what they, all the research and work that they did. Now, uh, changing uh, topics, because, uh, you know, away from these sort of personal attacks, um, which I, I think was important to bring up just to put things into context that, you know, the, these uh, 1988 scientists weren't exactly up to par themselves. But let's move on to the more substantial rebuttals to the carbon-14 dating. and. Uh, these are sort of the proposals that have been suggested so far as to, you know, how do we account? How did they get things so wrong? How, you know, what happened that could allow the 1988 results to come back with um, a medieval date of origin? But just it's important to put things into context before we get into that and, and just let you know that there are a total of 12 reliable dating methods and evidences which are claimed to pay, place the shroud much further back, centuries further back than the carbon-14 results would allow. Um, you know, so, some of the more prominent of which we're going to survey ourselves in part two of this study. And there's only one unreliable result, which is an outlier in suggesting medieval origin, namely this 1988 carbon-14 dating result. Are you really privileging this one result over all of the other reliable date uh, dating techniques that we have to prove that the shroud is older than the earliest allowable carbon-14 date of 1260 AD. By the way, it's important to mention here that there's actually a 13th uh, reliable date, uh, 13th dating result that places the shroud to the first century AD. Guess what that is? It's radiocarbon-14 dating. That's right, I, I mentioned Ray's sample that was taken back in 1973. And a couple threads of this were actually radiocarbon dated, getting results at 30 AD and 70 AD, plus or minus. Um, there is also a, a later sample that was uh, an outlier dating to around 200 AD or thereabouts as well. Um, but, geez, um, you know, the, why, why, haven't, uh, why didn't this result make headlines? Uh, why aren't we saying the shroud is proven to be Jesus, uh, to belong to Jesus or to come from the first century? Well, the, the reason for this is because, again, the, this radiocarbon uh, 14 result was unreliable. It, it didn't follow the proper scientific protocols. There was evident contamination from that area, the same area that the 1988 sample came from. Um, and because of this, the scientists were consistent and said, look, we, we just can't make a determination based on the results of this test. But guess what? Those same problems, as I proved, apply equally to the 1988 sample as well. So yeah, the two cancel each other out and therefore we're left with the 12 reliable dating methods placing the shroud centuries prior to uh, prior to when the carbon 1988 carbon 14 date 
uh, test suggests that it dates from. Now, in the first place, um, it's important to notice that uh, we do have the access to the method uh, that the radio 1988 radiocarbon uh, dating scientists used and how they arrived at their um, at their conclusions. And the original uh, radiocarbon uh, results, which were published in 1989, can actually be accessed uh, through a website um, at uh, shroud.com. So it's uh, if you type in www.shroud.com <coughs> slash nature.htm, you should get the original um, published results that the radiocarbon scientists themselves posted so you can confirm what's uh, being said here. But um, Rob Rucker has really used the information from the radiocarbon scientists themselves and he's conducted a statistical analysis of the data provided by these uh, 1988 radiocarbon scientists that they themselves provide. And he's determined that they purposely fudged the data in order to avoid the conclusion that there are significant differences in the results that they got. For, for example, they, one lab took eight, um, you know, there is eight results and they average that so that it looks like there's only four so that they get a result more consistent with what they want in a medieval period. Um, you know, secondly, they, in terms of the, I, I'm not an expert in statistics, so I'm, I'll provide sources for you guys to, to look this up. There are, there are detailed written uh, as well as video sources that uh, I can provide, uh, you know, as within this uh, pod, bonus podcast uh, so people can click on that for further details. But he's determined that there was um, more than a two sigma difference and that the probability of the average value and the variations of all the measurements being consistent with a random measurement error is only 1.4%. That means that there's a 98.6% probability that it wasn't just ran random errors plus systematic errors played a major factor in causing such dramatic differences in all of the measurement values that were obtained uh, using carbon-14 back in 1988. Um, this, this means that this is enough to say that you have, should have no confidence in the radiocarbon-14 results. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm not a statistician, stat uh, I'm not an expert in statistics, um, and this is a very technical study, so I'm going to provide the links for people to research on their own and make their own conclusions. However, it's, it's interesting that Rucker's analysis um, statistically matches a neutron, his neutron flux hypothesis. The, the dating of the shroud is perfectly statistically consistent with all the carbon-14 data that we would expect. Um, so basically with a neutron flux, he's, he's saying that the neutron uh, would cause uh, the shroud to appear younger than it actually is, and it would be varying throughout the cloth itself. So for example, in the center of the man's back, we would actually be expect to get a carbon-14 date of 8400 AD, you know, thousands of years in the future from now. Um, but other areas that are further away from that central location um, would be, would have, would be less, um, wouldn't be as, wouldn't date as far into the future. So, and statistically it calculates out that exactly in the location where the 1988 radiocarbon sample was taken from, uh, we would get in update in and about 1260 AD. That's exactly the result we got. Um, so, you know, I find that interesting. And what's even more interesting, as we'll learn, there's something called the Sundarium of Oviedo, and this is purported to be Jesus' head cloth and linked to the shroud. Again, we'll go into more details of that later. But it's interesting related to the dates because this was radiocarbon dated to around 700 AD. And under Rucker's statistical analysis, assuming that the cloth was taken off Jesus' head and placed by his side at the time the images were formed via this neutron flux hypothesis, um, that is precisely the date that we would expect to get 
uh, fitting very nicely with um, what Rucker's hypothesis is. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's interesting. There's, there's a lot of new work coming from the statistical analysis of the 88 results um, that shows, yeah, the, the results present, the data presented by the 1988 radiocarbon scientists themselves proves their results are totally unreliable and should be disregarded by anyone who's sincerely interested in truth. Now, uh, getting into what I, I wanted to, how, how do we explain the uh, how do we explain the um, 1988 radiocarbon dating results? And there have been um, about four uh, main ones related to contamination. One of which we we've already talked about a little bit was the neutron flux. But in terms of the basic types, so there's standard contamination, and then there's uh, enhanced contamination that's postulated to account for these results. And first we want to look at the standard contamination results. And um, the first under this category is uh, what's called the reweave, the invisible reweave hypothesis. So this, this hypothesis suggests that the corner of the shroud from which the radiocarbon sample was cut was actually repaired using younger materials at some point in the shroud's history in Europe. Uh, you know, STIRP scientist Ray Rogers um, had found some evidence suggesting that he thought this was the case. Um, and, you know, so there, there has been some evidence offered in support of this reweave hypothesis. Ho however, I think there are important counter arguments. And I actually think that this, this option is improbable. And this really comes because it, back in 2002, there was uh, various textile experts were summoned. Um, to take part in a shroud conservation project. So they took off the backing, they, they restored um, the shroud, and uh, you know they examined the sample area from where this carbon-14 sample came from. And they reported that um, they could not really identify or find any explicit evidence for reweaving. And you know this was also confirmed by STIRP with their X-ray and transmitted light photographs uh, taken of that sample area, there is, there is again, no evidence for reweaving that could be clearly discerned there. So really scientifically, I think this hypothesis is extremely unlikely and, and therefore falsified. We, we shouldn't really use this as an explanation as to why the Shroud's dating results gave us, um, you know, the, the medieval date range. And uh, this this um, result, in terms of these textile experts that I'm mentioning, that this refers to Mary uh, Fleury Limburg, uh, who is a, a noted textile expert, and we will be uh, making mention of her later on as well. Now, the second standard contamination hypothesis is the bioplastic contamination, and really, this hypothesis proposes that. Living microbes, uh, you know, bacteria or fungus, that sort of thing, left some sort of bioplastic coating on the shroud fibers, uh, at, at the very least in the sample area, um, if not on the entire shroud, um, where the 88 uh, carbon 14 dating was done. And, and this bioplastic residue uh, would explain why we got a medieval date, this anomalous dating result. However, the, the counter to this is conclusive. This, this we know for a fact is not true. In, in the first place, the radiocarbon dating scientists did do some standard pretreatment um, cleaning to get rid of contamination factors. And they did do whatever else I want to say about the lead carbon-14 scientists and you know their incompetence in certain areas. Um, the people that did the groundwork in the labs, uh, such as Christopher Ramsey, who's ne who was the who became the lead scientist at one of these AMS laboratories, um, they did do the standard pretreatment cleaning properly. They did do their due diligence when they're in the actual lab, and in terms of uh, that sort of thing, and counting, you know, in terms of counting the number of isotopes, uh, they did a good job there. So, but um, apart from that. What we also uh, know is that scientifically, if this hypothesis were correct, 
there would really be a near doubling of the mass of the sample um, because of this bioplastic contamination layer. That so, you know, it would be basically double, twice as heavy. And unfortunately, scientifically, we know that the average aerial density of the 1988 carbon-14 sample is the same as the rest of the sh shroud, as well as the same as other linen control samples of the same specifications. So this, scientifically, this hypothesis has been falsified. It's, it's just not true that the radiocarbon date was, was skewed based on some bioplastic contamination. Now we get into the uh, enhanced contamination hypotheses, and, and this is where the explanation is at. This, this is why, um, you know, one of these hypotheses is the reason why we got the dates that we have, in my opinion. And in, enhanced, by enhanced contamination, I'm, I'm simply referring to carbon-14 contamination that is non-standard. Um, you know, it, it would not have been accounted for in the standard pre-cleaning procedures uh, that were employed by the 1988 radiocarbon labs or the, the AMS laboratories at that time. And, um, you know, it's important to mention that uh, there, there were uh, suggested that other than the standard cleaning methods that the labs should have also done um, an elaborate pretreatment, scanning with electron microscopy, um, screening and, and testing, you know, microchemical or or um, mass spectrometry for, for the various impurities or intrusive substances, um, you know, things like higher order hydrocarbons or, or inorganic and organic carbonates. And, and these were all recommended back in 1986 as, as ways to prevent enhanced contamination and, and to identify um, you know, a proper sample site, and, and yet these were all ignored by these labs, and they just went with, you know, the worst possible location for their sample. Anyways, um, in terms of enhanced contamination, uh, the first one is really the carbon monoxide contamination hypothesis, and this is the one advanced by Sterp's uh, leader, or Sterp, one of Sterp's founders, uh, the Sterp scientist John Jackson. Um, basically, he says carbon monoxide is found at the Earth's surface, and it is highly enriched in radioactive carbon-14. So Jackson thinks that this carbon monoxide at the Earth's surface might be a significant source of contamination. And, and what's really interesting is, um, mathematically speaking, given the degree of natural radiocarbon enrichment in the atmosphere that, it, that has been measured, um, at sea level, it would only take a small amount of enhanced contamination on a factor of about 2% uh, carbon relative to the overall carbon in the sample um, that would be required in order to move a first century date for the shroud textile uh, to being in the 14th century, uh, just as the 88 radiocarbon lab laboratory results showed. Now, what's interesting here is that in 2008, Jackson discussed, uh, you know, various experimental results that he had with one of the AMS laboratories, the Oxford Radiocarbon Laboratory, and um, one of the original radiocarbon scientists, Christopher Ramsey, that was involved in the 88 um, dating. And, and, you know, he was the head of the laboratory at that time. And he made a very forceful statement that acknowledged the complexity of the contamination issue. He admitted this is a good explanation that needs to be taken seriously and could account for why they got the results that they did. Um, now, in fairness to Ramsey, he believes that the 88, 1988 results are in fact correct, but significantly his statement back in 2008 really erased the uh, emphaticness of you know, Gov and his ilk and, and Michael Tite, you know, these radiocarbon scientists that, you know, the, the shroud dates to 1260 to 1390, exclamation point, period, no question asked. And Ramsey, at the very least, to his credit, he removes this nonsense notion that, oh, we've just answered it once and for all. He, you know, um, these, these rash comments made by these leaders back in 1988. 
Um, here's, a, here's a quote of what Ramsey said specifically, so I'm quoting him. Uh, he says, with the radiocarbon measurements and with all the other evidence which we have about the shroud, there does seem to be a conflict in the interpretation of the different evidence. And for that reason, I, I think that everyone who has worked in this area, the radiocarbon scientists and all the other experts, really need to have a critical look at the evidence that they have come up with in order to for us to try and work out some kind of coherent story that, that fits and tells us the truth of the history of this intriguing cloth. And this this really is to Ramsey's credit. He's being open and honest with the evidence. And that, you know, the radiocarbon date dating results are not conclusive by any stretch of the imagination. There there are ways of accounting for how it could have gotten things so wrong. Now, uh, I want to switch to what I think is actually the most promising option, and we alluded to that before with Rob Rucker, and this is the neutron flux hypothesis. So um, way back in 1988, believe it or not, um, Thomas J. Phillips, who was the head of the high, high Energy Physics Laboratory at Harvard University, he suggested this and said that the shroud might actually have been fundamentally altered as a fabric with respect to its carbon-14 content um, due to its possible witness to some unexplained event, uh, namely the resurrection of Jesus, which resulted in a neutron flux of some sort. Um, now, it's possible that this flux of neutrons, if this is what happened, this could have skewed the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio of the linen cloth, placing it from the first century precisely into the, um, the medieval period. And as I said before, Rob Rucker has statistically proven that this is uh, the case. If this was true, um, it would lead to the results that we have. So, you know, the neutron flux is consistent with the data that we have, if true. Um, and there are various uh, scientists, you know, uh, Rucker, and, as well as uh, Mark Antonici and Arthur Lynn, have actually come up with various measurements and specific calculations which could be used to prove scientifically that the shroud was, in fact, neutron irradiated. Uh, of course, we're waiting on the Catholic Church for permission to conduct those tests, which don't look uh, at all promising at the moment. But, you know, you never know. It, it might come up one day. Um, but, uh, yeah, there, there are various non-invasive tests that could confirm. We have the ability to confirm whether this neutron flux hypothesis is actually true scientifically and once and for all explain why the 1988 uh, fiasco took place. Um, now, having said all of this, I, I want to fully admit that as of today, we still do not know the specific cause for the anomalous radiocarbon testing result. We, we have these various proposals, some, some better than others, but we're not in a position to say, yes, we know scientifically this is what happened. This is the answer as to why we got these anomalous re, uh, results back in 1988. So, um, you know, it's, it's definitely the case that further inquiry needs to continue to ascertain concrete answers to this enigma. Uh, but it's important to note that there are these, these um, plausible options which don't rule out the shroud dating back to the time of Jesus and which incorporate into the these anomalous 1988 readings. So uh, without any further ado, I think that will be the end for part one of our study on the Shroud. Next time in part two, I'm going to be uh, continuing on with the evidence for the historical provenance of the Shroud, but this time I'm going to be flipping over onto the, the pro-Shroud side and, and discussing what is the positive evidence. As I mentioned there is 12 uh, such evidences which demonstrate that the Shroud conclusively predates at uh, the earliest uh, date given by the radiocarbon scientists of 1260 AD. Um, we know for a fact, it, it's, it's conclusive that the Shroud predates 1260 AD based on this evidence, in, in my opinion. And uh, yeah, we'll go over some of that, some of the more uh, prominent evidences within those, those um, you know, um, within those pro shroud arguments to see what you guys make of it. All right, other than that, have a great day. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.